Okay, um, I'm inclined to go ahead and welcome our speakers to the stage, if, if you're ready. Creep, creep around. Come on up. <laughs> Maybe as you, uh, as you advance toward the, toward the lectern, I will read some bios. Um, I'll begin with Gus Capriva. And we'll just allow our panelists to gradually sort of make their way to this very cramped seating area. And then I will, um, I guess I'll give you this mic and give another to, to your colleagues. So Gus Capriva, born in Baden-Baden, Germany, Gustav Gus Capriva has lived and worked in Houston since 1962. He holds a degree in civil engineering from the University of Houston. He writes, my vision is to both support and promote education in the visual arts produced in Houston and in other national and international areas. I'm curator owner of the Capriva collection of over 2,000 works. My expertise lies in the er areas of German expressionism, French symbolism, American WPA, and contemporary art. He's the owner of Redbud Gallery since 1999. I purchase and sell art. Um, <laughs> And we have uh, organized, planned, estimated, fundraised, scheduled, and implemented major exhibitions in over 10 foreign venues over the last 10 years. Gus is joined by Sharon Capriva. Uh, Sharon was born in Houston, Texas, and currently works there as well as in Hope, Idaho. She earned her MFA in painting from the University of Houston, studying under John Alexander and James Searles. She was named Texas Artist of the Year in 2001 by the Art League of Houston, and the Texas State Visual Artist of the Year in 2005-06 by the state legislature. A concern for pre-Christian imagery entered her art and the tradition of memento mori, creating a, a remembrance of death. Uh, earlier, she depicted her beloved hounds in works that addressed the relationship between organized religion and nature. Her current series of three-dimensional reliefs on canvas represent the Idaho and, Idaho and Texas landscapes that are ever-present in her environments. She has had retrospective museum solos at the Menil Collection and the Ogden Museum of Art in New Orleans. Michael Collins. Michael Collins, who's um, extremely famous here in Lubbock, and famous in everywhere else too, but particularly beloved um, by Lubbock as he once served on our faculty. Michael wrote Collins is an artist recognized for producing <laughs> profoundly affecting figurative post-symbolist painting. Originally from Houston, Texas, he maintains his primary studio there with his wife, Gail. His works are primarily represented by Lou Allen Galleries in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and are also represented by Red Bud Gallery in Houston, Virginia Miller Gallery in Miami, and Galerie Ga in Paris, France. Collins has had over 50 solo exhibitions at nationally and internationally recognized gallery and museum venues, and has been favorably reviewed by such publications as Art News Magazine and Art in America. He's shown in group exhibitions in the US, Cuba, Peru, Germany, China, Denmark, Greece, India, Japan, and Turkey, among others. He's currently Senior Director of Visual Arts Department at Houston Baptist University, where he's also an artist in residence and painting, professor of art, and focuses on teaching in the MFA program. Carlos Canul is a contemporary abstract oil painter who lives and works in Splendora, Texas. He holds his MFA in painting from Houston Baptist University. A, nation of, a native of Brownsville, Texas, his work merges figuration with abstraction and draws upon his Mayan heritage, spiritual dialogue, and the natural surroundings he encounters wherever he goes. His undergraduate studies took place at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and Southern Methodist University. His artwork has been shown in solo and various curated and juried exhibitions in the US and Europe. Penuel currently holds a position as professor of visual art at Houston Baptist. He teaches painting and drawing and is director and lead curator of the Contemporary Art Gallery and the Fine Arts Museum on the HBU campus. <laughs> Lastly, Kelly Allison. Kelly Allison is a regionally recognized fine artist who spent over 40 years working and exhibiting in the Houston area. Her work can be seen internationally in both public and private collections. At age 25, she was the youngest artist included in the prestigious Fresh Paint, the Houston School, curated by Barbara Rose and Su Susie Khalil. Her public work includes two Wayfinder billboards on permanent exhibition in downtown Houston and the Houston Metro Transit System. Her involvement in alternative art throughout the years landed her a position as the project manager for the Houston International Performance Art Biennale in 2012 and 2014. She is currently acting director 
at the Contemporary Art Museum Plainview, where anyone who's visiting from out of town should go, because it's close by and it's awesome, um, where she's wrapping up her third year uh, in the Big Art and Small Town Project. Let's welcome everybody. Welcome, everyone. I love to see people passionate about art. As you can tell from my bio, I have no formal training in the arts. So I'm a perfect arbitrator or uh, coordinator of this panel discussion. Uh, I did a little research as an engineer of uh, one of our universities, uh, my university of Houston, past 10 years. I looked at their thesis programs, just to do engineering things, and I found out, so viewing those shows, that there was a 20% decline in painting, primarily due to, I would think, advances in technology and other, other media. I, I thought that was an interesting point. For me personally, uh, the collection of art, the curating of shows, it's my passion, and to me, the stories behind each one of you and the people on this panel, many times are much more interesting than the art, because I love the stories and the history, the passion that drives all you guys to create, whether you're in art history or visual arts or whatever, performing arts, it just, uh, it just gladdens the soul. So uh, I'm going to cover a brief history, because Dr. Heron did a very good job of covering uh, Houston art history. And what I'll do, I'll add some interesting points. These are all my opinion. Uh, and um, since many of these artists I did not know, you know I'm familiar with maybe 40 years of Houston art. Before that, it's all what I read, what I hear, I knew some of these people before they passed. So the first one, uh, who's control? Oh, you said found a controller. The first one is um, what Dr. Heron mentioned. I consider uh, underdog, considered a, a father of Texas art, but I also consider as a close second Emma Richardson Sherry. And her legacy, besides being almost 100 years old, being born in the mid 19th century, all the way died in the 50s, her legacy is that she was a, a driver behind the Museum of Fine Arts. And uh, to me, uh, you know, again, uh, trained in Europe and, and in the United States, from the Midwest, ended up in Houston. And she put, she was a major influence in Houston art in the early uh, 20th century. One of my favorite artists that discussed was, uh, was uh, Moses Horace Bess. He lived on a sandbar in Bay City, Port Lavaca area. He was a loner. He was a isolationist. He, he, he was depressed. He, he painted camouflage on ships during the war. Very interesting person. He, he would close his eyes, and what his brain transmitted to him, that's what he painted. Small paintings, various objects, all directly from his brain. But at the same time that he was reclusive <coughs> in the sandbar in the Gulf, he would be having monthly discussions with people like Betty Parsons in New York. So, you know, not totally uh, out of the communication link with New York. But again, he, uh, if you go to the Manil, the Manil's a major collector of his art, and he's in various important shows, you know, from the 50s on. So I consider him, he worked in San, lived in San Antonio and Houston, and so on. 
but I consider him a very important figure in the history of Houston art. Well, I might mention an interesting point. That he died in the 70s. He, he was a, an outsider, what you would call a spiritual artist, artist. And he strived to become a, a hermaphrodite. And I think those medical experiments and operations probably led to an earlier death than it would have. An interesting person, which would definitely warrant a film. Talked about Robert Preuser being uh, one of the fathers of uh, abstract art in Texas. And here's an example of a uh, uh, transition between figures and abstract. Interesting point about Preuser, who ended up at MIT, teaching 30 years at MIT, educated in, I think, the Chicago Art Institute. He went to Reagan High School in the Heights. Next artist, Frank Sotesta. Uh, no, this is another Robert Preuser. And I just love his work. This is on the cover of the book, Texas Abstract by Jim Edwards. Fabulous, fabulous. This, this work will stand up to any abstract work in the world. And bear in mind, like Kodinsky said, to paint a great abstract painting is very, very difficult. And I think he nailed it on this one. Frank Vitesca, Reagan High School again. That was a hell of an art teacher. He was a, he was a sophomore, Poyser was a senior. And he was a very good artist, but he hated, he was a perfectionist, and he ended up burning most of his painting. But if you look at, on the market for a, a painting by Frank, they're very rare. But his legacy, he was a co-founder of the Contemporary Arts Museum. There's a, there's a trend here. These guys are not only painters, they're, they're, they're leaving their mark uh, in the Houston art scene. Michael's going to cover uh, Sullivan. Uh, Stella Sullivan was an interesting painter on many levels. Uh, when you think of her experience as being a Houston artist by way of being um, Michigan, um, going through um, the Cranbrook, Institute for her masters, and then ending up through Sam Houston State University, um, the School of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts, where my father had known her, and then University of Delaware. But her still lifes uh, and other paintings were very extremely well handled and completely competent. And it, it, in a way, you think regional on some senses, but the still life, people, places, and things rather ubiquitous and becomes often a, an anchor for many people working, at least in our city, and was so, so, so much so during the 40s and 50s, and even into some early parts of the 60s. Okay. Uh, we, we mentioned quite a bit about John Biggers. John Biggers is, is a person, uh, an artist from uh, Eastern Carolina, North Carolina. He studied at Hampton Institute. And, has a degree, uh, I think, a degree at uh, Penn State. He, Dr. Victor Lowenfeld, the father of art education, who fled Europe during the Nazi area, Nazi era. He was invited to come to Houston in 1950. New school, new art department, PSU, Texas Southern University. And this one person, through the last half of the 20th century, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention it, or I'll indicate that through the various artists we'll go through, influenced so many artists of color in Houston that uh, it, it's almost unbelievable the, uh, the number of students he left behind that are still practicing or producing great art. So uh, he won a prize, a, a little story, free, free uh, civil rights. In the early 50s, he won a prize at the MFA. I think it was a drawing show. I'm not sure. Anyways, they had a reception for the winners and the opening of the exhibition at the museum. 
They found out he was black. So he told them not to come to the opening. So they had, they had to have a private opening because he was black. I think that was just a, a wonderful side story about Dr. Figures at, at Houston in those years. Uh, next, we'll talk about another very important person in Houston art history, Lowell Collins. I would say before even speaking of my father's work, I would look at uh, John Biggers and the way he interacted in the community. He was one of my first teachers in my studio as a family studio, parents, aunts and uncles, all Cranbrook trained. Uh, he would come in and dialogue and there was never a racial separation or any kind of spirit except what if. Let your soul show you the way. How does art connect to cultural um, diaspora and how can we all uh, represent aspects of the human condition in ways that are unique. He stressed drawing. Uh, he and my father were, were very, very close friends. Um, he was the head at TSU, uh, more or less an artist in residence for them. Dr. Wardlaw, who couldn't be here today with us, Alvia, uh, whose father's had a stroke, so she apologizes, would have really added into her history of working with, with John Biggers. But my father, at the same time John was at TSU, was the dean of the museum school, now called Glassell, and helped get it accredited based on Cranbrook's model. Yeah. My father studied with Thomas Hart Benton. He was, um, by way of meeting Otis Dozier at Colorado School of Arts and Design in Colorado Springs, um, then went to Art Students League in New York with Etzel Kramer, shared an apartment, another African-American painter in Houston, did Barbara Jordan's portrait in Austin. If you in, in Austin, look at it. It's a fabulous painting. And Maybe you could refer to these painters, uh, as, as Dr. Heron did, as possibly regional, but I think truly what is out becomes in. Bert Long said, let your soul show you the way, and we'll talk about Bert in a moment, but he, he really was talking about painting may not be favorable for a while. It comes and goes. But if we look at the cave paintings in Dorgon, if you look through Europe, even in Pertinalis and down in southern portions uh, of the Rio Grande, there's great painting examples uh, that could be tens of thousands, 30,000 years, years of age. So paintings, urgencies keep coming back. Lowell was um, an interesting Renaissance personality. He studied, as I said, in a variety of schools. Uh, when, as I was a child, we would have family member, a guest at our home, family members usually, but occasionally you'd have people like Marcel Duchamp and you'd have Lee Bontecue come and stay at our home. Uh, so I remember these stories about the reported death of painting that were uh, still fresh in my mind from two and three and four years of age. And yet it was almost a sarcastic retort. Duchamp knew that it wasn't dead. And I think anybody that continues painting in the state realizes that tidal surgency. Uh, he, uh, as a young artist, was involved with, uh, again, Houston primarily, but uh, had been at the Art Students League in New York and worked with Harry Sternberg, the great printer there. Uh, he was really interested in that kind of odd, uh, figurative collision between abstraction and representation, which I think is what John Biggers was doing with his patterns coming out of in his Anansi book, where you really see these kinds of fusions together, and which is really uh, something that affects m many, many painters. Uh, and still to this day, it affects me in my studio practice. Okay. We'll talk, really, we're going to talk a little more about Dr. Figures' legacy since it was so important. Uh, this is uh, Annie Moore. She was a teacher, helped many students in high school. She's from East Texas. A town so small, I, I can't even find it on a map anymore. But her, her mantra, which she also learned from Dr. Biggers, it took her a while coming from East Texas and from her background as a poor uh, sharecropper's daughter. Was she, she always said to her students, don't be afraid. If you've got a crazy idea when you're creating something, do it. Don't let anybody hold you back. Uh, and I think 
coming from a, a woman with her background and her success as a, as a painter uh, is, is memorable. We have, here's another TSU artist, Ed Mills. Cotton picking. He loved to depict his race working in the fields. He, he did a lot of work studying at TSU under figures. He did a lot of uh, work during the 60s, a turbulent time in Houston with uh, riots, murders by police, and so on. So uh, his paintings reflect both his culture and the, the times that, uh, that we went, underwent at that time. <clears throat> Next one is uh, R.V. Um, Johnson. And he, another TSU student, he, he's been teaching at TSU for a long time, another student at Dr. Bigger. He's from Port Arthur, which I thought was interesting. Port Arthur, Texas, home on. Home of birthplace of Bob Rauschenberg. Janis Joplin. Uh, Richard Stout. Uh, John Alexander. It's, like, it's sort of like Lubbock. Yeah. It's Joe Ely, Buddy Holly, you know, Terry Allen. I mean, where do you stop? Mac Davis. Just, just amazing where certain cities, certain areas just produce fabulous creative uh, minds and energy. Next uh, is Dorothy Hood. We, we talked quite a bit about her. And I've always thought it kind of interesting. Very good painter. He's from Bryan, Texas, A&M land. He, uh, he spent a lot of time in Mexico with the greats, Roscoe's, the Quieros, and so on. She reportedly was a lover of Pablo Neruda, which is a wonderful story. And if you ever see a small Dorothy Hood painting with a poem collage to the surface with ink script, grab it if you can, because that's a love letter from Pablo Neruda. Can't come from Alice, I mean. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's a great story. It, it, the backline story is even better, but uh, I'll leave it at that. And I think it's interesting, considering that Dorothy Hood is her painting, is, like Dr. Heron said, is located rest next to the restroom in the Kinder Building. And her archives are not in the Houston MFA. They're in the Corpus Christi Museum, Museum of South Texas. Interesting. The politics behind that. Another artist, Richard Stout, mentioned from Beaumont. Chicago Art Institute. And he, he taught at the University of Houston 30 35 years. He just recently passed. Very important artist to the Houston art scene. Next. Kermit Oliver, another TSU person. He, uh, he's a postman. He works for the Postal Service in Waco. He might still be doing it. He's in his 70s. Sorry. Painted children and animals. He's one of our artists that commands high prices in, in the commercial art world. And I think uh, I, I was very proud when Herme, uh, under Stanley Marcus, uh, with a collaboration with Stanley Marcus from Dallas, picked a couple of his paintings for their, their scarf design. I thought that was real cool. They typically selected French-based painters for their scarves. And uh, two of uh, Kermit Oliver's <laughs> scarves are... Uh, Hermes. John Alexander, Beaumont, SMU grad, taught at the University of Houston, Karen's teacher, uh, and he helped. I don't know if this is a known fact or not, but he helped Barbara Rose curate fresh paint. He was a major driver. 
sometimes I wonder who the curator was. But I'll let Sharon discuss that later. But uh, it's a fabulous painter living now in Amagansett. And then uh, we'll cover one more Dr. Biggers student, heard samples. Again, African culture, legends, great painter, now heavily involved in music and, and painting. Luis Jimenez, El Paso, taught at the University of Houston for several years. Uh, I consider one of our most notable Hispanic artists. Multi, multi uh, media. He, uh, he was, um, he was one of the artists that actually was killed by his own work. If you ever go to Denver, outside near the airport, you'll see a, a huge sculpture called the Devil Horse. Not the real name, but it's after uh, Appaloosa's horse that he had. And using poor equipment under very unsafe conditions, come along that he was using, slipped, and the head of the horse crushed his femoral artery, and he essentially bled in on the way to Rio Dosa. He lived in Hondo, New Mexico. Great loss. Plus, he had, and he was one eye. He, he created such wonderful piece of art with one eye. And then he would drive from Hondo to Houston to teach. I mean, I can't even, I can't even think of doing that. He blind of one eye. Another painter, you've been to New Orleans, you've been to Jackson Square. You see these guys encircling the square painting, street scenes, portraits, you know, and you know what? Well, Lucas Johnson was there in those days, in the 60s, 50s, 60s, painting under another name. He ended up in Mexico, and as you can see from the colors, uh, deeply influenced by Mexico. A great painter, and he, he died. One passion was his art, his second passion was fishing. So he died in, uh, in uh, the Gulf fishing. That's the way he wanted to go, and he, that's the way he went. Great, great painter. We talked about Bert Long, who was a bigger in life character. We were in Paris one time looking at the Rodin, Rodin Museum, the gates of hell. Bert come up with his beret. He said, I want one of those. <laughs> one of those museums right here. The Bert Law Museum of Paris. He is a uh, great, great character. Fabulous. To hear, uh, what, what was very interesting about his work, he, he would he would paint, this is one of his, probably his most famous work, I think, called Riding the Tiger. <clears throat> but the frames, the framework on these are as good as the art itself. It's all one piece. Next we'll have Kelly. Kelly Allison, the foremost uh, vineyard owner in uh, North Texas or West Texas. Well, first of all, I want to say um, what a pleasure it is to be here with all of my friends from Houston and also to see faces that I have come to know here in Lubbock. Um, one of the things I wanted to um, talk about today was uh, when they mentioned regionalism. Regionalism was a very big factor for me when I was in Houston. Uh, Gus has already mentioned quite a few of the artists. Uh, Bert Long, um, Lucas Johnson, uh, Jesse Lott. Uh, there was a feeling that we were talking about our space, our time, where we were. Um, and I really uh, got to where I was part of that community. Uh, John Alexander was also one of my professors. And you can probably see his influence a little bit in this work they've got up here. Uh, another thing that uh, 
as I've come to Lubbock, I moved. I grew up in Plainview, by the way. Some of y'all are probably uh, familiar with Plainview. It's uh, about 45 miles north of here. I moved back uh, four years ago to take care of my aging parents who have now passed. Uh, but while I have been here, I have uh, kind of re-experienced a different type of regionalism. Uh, I've uh, gotten very involved with people like E.C. Gilbert and Andy Don Emmons, uh, Mary Marie Alford, uh, let's see, um, there's several others that I could mention. Uh, I think here at Texas Tech with Shannon Cannings and Gee as y'all teachers, y'all have really got a wonderful foundation here in art. I'm so reminded of the beginnings of Houston when I was there 40 years ago. Uh, Lubbock is quite a bit smaller community, but when we started back in Houston, it was quite a bit smaller community as well. Uh, there were some things happening at um, the University of Houston with the Lawndale Art on Annex. It's very much about, very similar to what's going on that I see here with Luca and what surrounds it. And I have just really found a home here. I'm actually not probably going to come back to Houston permanently. I'm probably going to stay here. And I think that it's perfectly fine to embrace where you are, what moves you, um, why it is that this place has become part of my soul and how I can express that in my work. I have, since I've been directing at the Art Museum in Plainview, I've pretty much taken a sabbatical from creating my own art. I probably, now that I've been here three years and it seems like that's long enough of a sabbatical, I'm hoping to get back to it. And I really do appreciate uh, being asked to be on this panel. So thank you guys. Okay. Michael will talk about Virgil Grotto. <clears throat> Virgil was a dear friend of all of ours on this panel and possibly many of yours as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, the time I had spent at Texas Tech with was three most memorable years. I look out in the audience and see people I know and love, and the students here, like my father always said when he was at, uh, up at Cranbrook and other institutions, the great students happen everywhere. Great artists that happen where life happens. Art about life. Well, Virgil started off painting trucks, uh, photorealism, uh, painting uh, highway engines like she really more of a descendant of Charles Sheeler. Um, he, he was somewhat quick to morph. He uh, moved to Houston. He actually had a house painting business where he hired the art guys and many other, many other artists in the region. And they had gainful employment while they were making their work. But Virgil uh, was at, at the university with me at HBU with Jim Edwards. And Virgil contracted brain cancer. And on he really was quite heroic the way he battled it, but his last works were of brain scans of his own cancer that he asked the doctor to give him, and he made these beautiful paintings. Um, he, he was a free spirit about collaboration. He worked with Waldo Bean, a great artist in Europe, uh, but he, he believed, uh, who had studied with buoys in the park uh, in Europe, in Germany, but Virgil believed in a freedom and a fluidity uh, so coming from a narrative background to uh, abstraction with heavy content, um, I, I feel like he was an extraordinary colleague at the university. And um, we've grown from three students, thanks to my learning about MFA programs that are outstanding. I think Texas Tech has one of the best in the whole country. And we've applied a lot of what I learned at HBU, and now we're up to about 30 students. Virgil would be proud. He, when we started, we had three back in uh, 2000, uh, well, whenever it was, 2010. And it is an honor to be here with all of you today. I'm really honored to be with my panelists, but also to be back at this great university. So I have one more. Ibsen Espada. Now, Ibsen, I wish I had more Hispanic artists on the committee. <clears throat> Ibsen and I showed together uh, with McMurtry Gallery. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yes. And Ibsen uh, had an interesting way of painting. He was from Puerto Rico. And if you remember your Hispanic uh, exhibition that traveled all around the nation. He and Carlos Alfonso, who was on the Mariel boat lift, we were all friends. And we showed together with McMurtry. Um, and 
Ibsen, we also had Paul Sierra and Arnoldo Roche Rabel, who also passed, most of them are, are dead except Paul and uh, Ibsen. But Ibsen had a tremendous way of working fluidly on papers, rice papers, and he would laminate them and glue them onto other canvases. And he really worked uh, a, a, a wide dimensions within his work, but they were very flat. You get the feeling of great texture, but there, were, there was a, a, a Juan Miro kind of adherence to some of his fluidity and his movement. Um, and, and he's still making art to this, to this day. Um, but just a painter, he didn't want to get so much into teaching. He's been a visiting artist at our programs, but really is a dedicated to what he does in his paintings. This is, uh, Dr. Heron mentioned uh, Harold James's work, and especially in archiving in, in, uh, in, uh, in the museum. Abstract painter, as you can see, and as you can determine with all of these artists, the past is dictating the present. It is directly connected. Every one of these guys we're talking about Many of you never heard of uh, are connected to someone or some event before them to, to, to do what they do. And this uh, tarot was greatly influenced by Dorothy Hood, which you can probably see. I wanted to, sh I wanted to add uh, two or three artists besides Michael that are doing quite well since I'm involved in buying and selling art. There are three artists. Uh, that are probably very prominent on the national scene, and that is uh, Mark Flood, who got his start uh, uh, painting around cloth on, on canvas. But they're quite beautiful abstract with vibrant colors. And then uh, a teacher, Michael Ray Charles, another U of H grad, who is hired back from UT, Austin now is teaching at the University of Houston, and obviously uh, a lot of black symbolism. Uh, he's, these guys are doing well in the, in the national art market. And of course, Trenton Doyle Hancock, who's from East Texas, I think he went to A&M. Uh, he's another uh, black artist that uh, uh, is using uh, you know, the symbolism and the culture and so on to do some very, very good work. And he's been picked up by you know, very important galleries in Europe and, and the United States. My next, uh, next artist we'd like to talk about is someone that uh, I know a little about. <laughs> and instead of just letting her talk about her work, I was going to ask her uh, what she can tell us about how the Fresh Paint ex exhibit was uh, selected. First of all, I want to say I am connected to Texas Tech. I love Texas Tech. I'm connected through the junction. I don't know. They don't do it anymore, but um, I, I attended several sessions of, so I was a student of Texas Tech. And I'm proud of that. Uh, what, sir? How's, how's that? Ooh, that scared me. Okay. <laughs> all right. So he wants me to talk about fresh paint, and I have kind of, and, and Kelly knows all this too, but first, just one tiny step before that. What created this um, Houston School of Art? And it really did exist, but it was a smaller core of this, that whole exhibition that became Fresh Paint. And it, it happened at University of Houston. It happened because a building burned. And all the art students, um, undergraduate and graduate, all mixed together in this huge warehouse, no air conditioning. You know, so as serious, serious painters remained there. And it was something that uh, Chairman George Bunker, thank goodness, did not check in on after hours. Because we were there around the clock. And there was, there was booze and there was pot and there was everything you can imagine. And it became um, the most linked together, maybe, school of art in a long time. And when John Alexander, he pretty much knew what was going on, but he wasn't there at midnight with us. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, when he, I, he and Barbara Rose discussed this, 
because the bodies of work of all the students coming out of there, we did, we ended up creating kind of a look. And it was a look that was um, German Expressionism mixed with Romanticism, you know, in, in our own individual region. So they decided on this show and talked to the museum, because Barbara worked at the museum, talked her into doing this. Well, so they gathered some of us, and then there were so many other artists in Houston <coughs> who felt so left out, they ended up opening up this exhibition. And so instead of the Houston School, it really became the diversity of Houston, which was also just as fair a subject. But if that answers any of that. I want to say something. Oh, sorry. Shortly about Barbara Rose. When she was uh, curating this uh, show, I had moved out to the countryside outside of Houston, uh, about 60 miles south in a very rural community. I've always kind of gravitated towards the rural. And we had a long chicken barn. And the chicken barn had no sides on it or anything. And it was probably 100 feet long. I had decided to move my studio in there. So I had probably 50, 60 paintings sitting around. Barbara Rose arrived on the scene with high heels on. It was muddy as it can be out there. And she tromped through my backyard in the mud, kind of lost her balance once, and we had to catch her before she fell down in the mud. We got out to my studio, and there was like seven cows standing in my studio <laughs> looking at the artwork. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to put that in there because my, my meeting with her was pretty funny. That's right. That's Oh, okay. Okay, I have to say, you know, about once every five years, I allow myself to do a blue bonnet painting, and I enjoy doing that more than anything because that's, um, you know, that's not the norm for me. But I find that every time someone does some kind of publication about my work, they throw in a blue bonnet painting, so <laughs> they must like them. But um, we kind of, they were kind of called taboo bonnets when I was in school because serious artists didn't do that. But I, I loved doing it. And I also, I'm, I made this one, I'm, I've been doing paintings that kind of, uh, they're built out from the, from the board or canvas. And so I, I figured out a way to build out blue bonnets. And I had, um, you know, it became like an exercise for me in learning how to do something. So that's one of the, one of, you know, blue bonnets are going to be my favorite subject, and it's coming up on five years, so I'll probably be doing another one. <laughs> and this, is, this is, this, I'll be, try to be brief, but um, this is, this kind of represents the direction I'm going now, and it just happened because I got so involved in hearing all the Me Too and all the women's movement and how much advancement women have actually made and how many people are so supportive. So this piece is called Breaking Bonds, and it's, for me, about, um, I might call it more of a drawing, but there's paint on it, so it can legitimately be a painting. And it's large. It's about um, probably 17 feet wide and then human height. So um, I just took different, I wanted to do women. They're made up, but they're, then they're not any particular, I'm trying to make them not any particular race. Our culture just representing all women but breaking loose from psychological or physical situations I wanted to include both and um, so there's rope or chain um, blocks but I've given every one of them there's a method this this cutters or scissors something hidden in the background that's there to allow, um, because I think more and more women are grabbing that tools and working themselves out of whatever psychological or physical bondage they're in. And that's what this piece is about. Thank you, Sharon. Michael? Well, <clears throat> I'm coming out of this community, it's so rich and varied and diverse. It's not hard to pick up when we look in the mirror or we think about our dreams or the poetry we love, 
are those people we love within the construct of poetry in a life that become important. My art comes out of the human experience, comes out of poetry, dreaming. It comes out of ambiguity that you might see in artists that come from history all the way back to Goya or Turner. And I, I was interested in Houston and the Fresh Paint School, but beyond that, I, I was so young at that moment, I wasn't included in that exhibit. I was in the Houston 88 remake of it that Nell Prince and Marilyn Zeitland and um, Ann Tucker and I think um, one of the other curators at the Menil or the, uh, the Contemporary Art Museum at the time were the four curators that adjudicated that. But it was a great honor to be, and as a young painter, to be included with this magnitude of thinkers. Um, the idea of the psychological that Sharon just talked about, that emotional, the connection with the physical, this painting, uh, Courtyard of Bound Trees, is in the collection of the Art Museum of South Texas in Corpus, and it relates to my direct observation of trees that I saw bound at the perimeter of 9-11. I was with one of Carlos Canul's buddies and mine, and actually knows all of the panel, um, Theo Stanley, and he owns Harbor Pictures in Manhattan. Uh, Theo and I were walking with my wife, Gail, and his wife, Cynthia, who's a dancer, around the perimeters, <clears throat> and he had been working for Bruce Weber at the time, so he had press passes. Bruce was a photographer and by way of many things, um, able to go in and photographically record what was happening. And I kept, we were there right after it happened and we could see the smoke rising out of these this vast destruction. And I kept thinking about these trees that were bound just as you drove or walked by the entry near Battery Park. And I kept thinking about them and I started drawing them and Theo said, you're gonna make a painting out of that. So flash forward from 2001 to 2004, I met, went through many smaller studies. And so this painting began to be structured in the courtyard of the gladiators in Pompeii, which I had also been taking grad students to tech and other, other, uh, other groupings to Europe, to Italy. And I wanted to put those trees, which could be standing for wombs, that we might rebirth our culture and one another. But there was a kind of tragic glory, which I could feel from that. And I kept dreaming about them. So that was the impetus to Courtyard of Boundaries. Uh, Earth Mother, if you know and love Mesoamerican mythology, collected, you know, adhered to its traditions, which my father and I absolutely loved. Uh, Lima legends, Narit, Jalisco, when you really delve into them, so much of that is in Houston. And thank goodness our state has a, a large group of of Hispanic artists that work in it. That's why I was lamenting the fact that I could only show you Ibsen, and we have Carlos coming up. But this painting was a oddly juxtaposed Earth Mother vision within a Catholic church ruin that was in near Venice. I'll let you think about those juxtapositions. And then this painting was a, actually an initial version of it I did back in 93. And it was a, a dream I had of an aqueduct, or you could call it a bridge, but two small children as I was experiencing a divorce. And the dream was of my children, but it could almost be of anyone in pandemic. We're isolated. We stand where we have a vista of what goes on around us. And yet the landscape behind these figures that were isolating uh, was illuminant, but it was illuminating a field of destruction, these ruins from a dream were a coliseum as if a halo for some non-specific god. So there was this realization that these juxtapositions between darkness into enlightenment, between the mythic and the quotidian, and the idea of realism and abstraction colliding, that's what was so, so totally humanistic about fresh paint and about Houston and about Texas and why I'm really honored to be with you all today. I, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, with this piece, it's a it's an oil on panel, it's an abstract painting, but I I feel like th in this piece, um, it really allowed me to sort of understand a new direction for me. I I don't know exactly the year this was done, maybe 2014. I started um, moving into a direction where by where I would destroy the painting, I would destroy the image, and then paint back over it, and continue to build on top of the surface. And so surface treatment for me 
yes. was something uh, really important in, in, in a direction that I was going with, with painting, having, been, having had my uh, background being in more representational uh, figuration. Um, coming from SMU and the Chicago Art, <clears throat> the Art Institute of Chicago, um, <clears throat> I got a lot of influence from the images and, and the paintings that I would see on my way to class. Uh, in the Art Institute of Chicago at the museum itself. And in these uh, vast uh, galleries, I would see artists like Roberto Mata. I would see some of the abstract expressionists and the surrealists. And I always say to myself that without the surrealists, I don't know that you would have that movement of the abstract expressionists. Um, that, I believe, was a catalyst for where I started, you know, my leanings in painting where they started to go. And then when I transferred to SMU, I had mentors like Bill Commodore, who would destroy his paintings. He would you know, th you know, put these, of course, at that time he was doing figuration. And, but his surface treatments were really uh, something new for me. And also Michael, the way he uses the paint and the way he slings paint, it really direct, it really affected me in the way I um, started to interpret the use of paint and how, how I can use it and, and, and what methods I could employ on the surface of the canvas, the linen, or in this case, um, a panel, wood panel. So, you know, I, I'm always interested in maintaining that figuration or that level of representation and bringing abstraction and representation together is something that Yes, I continue to struggle with, but I think I'm starting to really uh, get the gears moving on it and, and, and really starting to feel, get a really good feel for it. Um, now I'm moving more into uh, an area of landscape. I don't have any examples of that. But for me, the landscape is sort of a, a memory of my history. And because of the, uh, my cultural lineage, being, that being of the Maya, I, I feel, and being from Texas, I'm seventh generation Texan, um, I feel like there's, there's something to be said about that. There's something to be said about where, you know, our, our histories come from. And, but I'm still dealing with abstraction. I'm still having elements of abstraction with elements of, you know, a little, you know, punctums of representation here and there. And, uh, that's not to say that I won't ever try to go back to, you know, figuration or, or, or more uh, representation, but this is, this is what I enjoy doing right now. And for me, paint, I paint for my own astonishment. And I really feel like, you know, if I can sort of satisfy those needs uh, within, within my painting practice and my, uh, you know, I'm also, I also draw. The drawing is very much an important part of my, my painting modalities. And I, and I feel like you have to, you know, it all starts with the mark. And when, whenever it is that you draw and, and whenever it is that I'm drawing, I feel like at some point that could also become a painting. But it doesn't necessarily always transfer to a, success, a successful painting. I feel like some of my drawings actually have a, a, a better energy, a stronger energy than some of the paintings. Paintings kind of get contrived sometimes. And it's like, that's when you decide, okay, I'm going to destroy this painting. And then some, something new happens. And in, with this painting, that's what was happening. I was in the middle of destroying the painting. And something, something happened in there. There was something in this image that I was able to pull something out from that and say, OK, this little area here works. This I can continue to destroy. And it all kind of just came together in, over, in a matter of, really, a matter of a couple of minutes. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you find that bliss. And you just, kinda, you just leave it alone. You know, so, um, and it remains untitled for that reason, because it really wasn't about anything specific. It wasn't, I wasn't trying to, you know, work from one of my drawings. I wasn't trying, but, but it was all of the, the experiences of, of what I had seen and, and what, I, what I bring to my work where, where this painting ended up, and I, and I, and I felt that this was um, a very, very satisfying work for me. So, um, thank you. Some of you may, many of you may know Randall Moseman. I met Randall when I first was teaching at Texas Tech in 
Tina and Andrew and others uh, were on my committee and met Randall as a metalsmith working with uh, Mr. Glover, a tremendous jeweler and metal artist. Uh, after he graduated, he also took painting and advanced painting. I was able to teach him as an undergraduate, uh, or actually muse with him would be more the proper word. Randall's had a particular idea for a long time of what he wanted to make his art about. But he went to Thailand and, and taught English to Thai young students, and then ended back up in Dallas, and long story or shorter, uh, ended up at our MFA program at HBU. And he's even adjuncted for us afterwards. Randall's a really strong painter, and Gus and I put a few of these uh, artists in the Houston area that are just almost right out of grad school as examples of what's happening. The next is Rachel Gardner, and Rachel, in grad school, met Sharon Capriva, came over and did a uh, soft sculpture workshop with uh, different sorts of materials, paper mache, and um, in any event, Rachel had been a painter for quite some time. She was also a student at Texas Tech and then transferred over to, uh, was a soccer player, and transferred over to um, um, I think it was Stephen F. Austin. But she's become very active in our community. She's a professor with us at HBU uh, and is absolutely, and with Carlos, absolutely an excellent artist and motivator. She's extremely interested in community and in a diversity of experience that we have at our university. And the last, um, but not least, is a young artist, the youngest of all of the people we've shown you, Joel Stanulonis. Joel had been an honors college student in Houston. We had known him <clears throat> and went to Philadelphia for his graduate degree, and we actually hired him back. He was selected out of all the grad programs in the United States in the Painter Magazine as the top work. And he's in the museum collection in Philadelphia, and he's very interested in uh, collage, uh, I probably tried to break him of that Kincaidian habit of effusive and garish color. At least his faculty in grad school sent us a thank you note about that. But he's an interesting painter and, and by forth of using photography and digital media has, is producing some intriguing work. Um, Folks, we have come to the end of the slides. I can't believe it. We actually, no, we, we did pretty well on the time. I want to I want to thank everyone for their patience and listening to us. And if you have any uh, questions or any topics that you'd like to expand, just contact each one of us individually as we mill around. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>